Welcome to the R Metroidvania podcast. I'm Professor Q. And this is Caldrath from the R Metroidvania Discord and subreddit. This is Master. I'm also from there. And Master. Today, we will be playing Cuphead. It's, it's a platformer, it's not a Metroidvania. I need but look, it's hard. I need to look at, uh, up what, which website put this on their top 10 Metroidvania games. <laughs> Probably thought, a few of them. I thought that was great when they did that. <laughs> but can you make it through the tutorial? That's going to be the next hour, right? <laughs> Maybe. You guys, did you guys see the video of the one? Hey, hey, video? don't spoil my joke. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Uh, we ruined it. I'm sorry. We <laughs> you should have told me you were going to make that joke. <laughs> All right, let's make some other relevant jokes so people forget about it. Uh, the cake is a lie. Um, this game is more difficult than over 9,000. Uh, so is this a Souls-like? Uh, it's hard, so <laughs> it must be. It, it is a Souls-like. They keep their souls in a cup. Yeah, you collect souls, so... Okay. <clears throat> Do you actually collect, like, milk or whatever in this game? Wait, you do literally collect souls in this game, don't you? Yeah. That's funny. Oh yeah, you're working for the devil. I forgot about that. <laughs> I've actually not played this game more than mm, 20, 30 minutes over at a friend's house. He wanted to play co-op with me. <clears throat> Alright, show us how hard this game is. Oh, what was it? The Cyber Shadow that came out this week that apparently doesn't have a duck button? Yeah. And that was bothersome to some people. Mega Man doesn't have a duck button. It eventually got a slide, which is similar. <clears throat> Didn't they patch this so it, uh... So it was easier? <laughs> It's pretty difficult right now. I don't, I don't think I can play this on stream. <laughs> is, is this a puzzle? Like, <laughs> do you have to figure this out? For the right person, it kind of is. <laughs> that is the question. Yeah, but did we ever decide what's the difference between a puzzle and another kind of challenge? Like, No, we didn't. I was suggesting that there really is no way to know for sure. Uh, or like, it's one of those you know it when you see it things. I think that I would say that it's based on the percentage of time that it takes for figuring out what you're supposed to do versus actually doing it. So the the amount of time for execution. However, like that particular situation that we just saw, uh, the the joke is if you haven't seen it, how's it going, Sphere Um Thank you for confirming that the stream is live. I was making sure. I was actually checking that right now. Uh, like, th this was based off of a meme. I guess somebody was demoing this game and spent, what, 30 minutes just on that part trying to figure out how to dash across that? Something yeah. like that. Something crazy. Um, does that make it a puzzle because he couldn't figure that out? <laughs> Still think puzzle puzzles yeah. are in about intentionality. If you're trying to make a puzzle, it's a puzzle. You think so? Can you unintentionally make a puzzle? Well, like, I mean, I th okay. I should clarify. If you're, if something isn't really a puzzle, but then you like, you say it's a puzzle. It's kind of a puzzle. So what if it's you claim that it's a puzzle, but people can just like instantly figure it out? What if you claim your game okay. is a Metroid? If you claim that something's a puzzle, <laughs> and it's like it's not really a puzzle, but like. Any, you know, anything can be a puzzle because it's just like something you have to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you're just figuring out things as you're playing on the like micro level. So if you're trying, if you claim that it's a puzzle as the developer, I think it's, it's a puzzle, sort of. It's a loose definition. I think it's the other way around. I think that the puzzle is in the eye of the beholder, just like art. Is in the eye of the beholder. Like, what is art? Is what I brought up last week. 
Maybe. Um, I think so it, it, it also doesn't matter whether somebody thinks the thing they're making is art? Yeah, I actually think that's absolutely true. Um, that somebody can make something that someone will look at as art and vice versa. Uh, and they could do diagonal uh, super attacks. That's cool. Tutorial doesn't tell you that. You had to puzzle that out, Master. I did. It was a puzzle. <laughs> Is that really a puzzle? <laughs> so I think there's a lot of things that we would definitely agree is a puzzle just because we're used to them being puzzles, like Sokoban block pushing puzzles, Legend of Zelda. Great. But if a, a mechanic that you don't realize exists and then you suddenly realize it exists, that is not a puzzle. If a block puzzle is so simple that like you just instantly know it, that's just normal navigation. It's no longer a puzzle, right? But what if they intended for it to be a puzzle? Well, I'm, I'm talking about Q's definition of it's in the eye of the player, what a puzzle is. I think, yeah, I, I think that it's in the eye of the player and it, it is defined by how much effort you have to fit, take to figure it out. So I think that would mean it's more in the experience of the player than sure. what, well, that's they, what their belief is. That's what the eye of the beholder sort of denotes, although I guess if you're talking literally, yeah. In the experience of the player is what I mean to say. Just not hit these blue things, jeez. So, uh, um... Good guy on the... Uh, Metroidvania Review Discord shared a game earlier today that had really fluid animations and it reminded me of this game. They put so much effort into making these animations just incredibly fluid. I don't know if that's like the best usage of resources. It works for this game. Everybody paid attention to it. Graphics, I think... Oh my god. Aesthetics really sell games a lot. I haven't used my dash since I started playing. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you took so long getting through that tutorial and you completely forgot about it? Well, the part that he was uh, stuck on in the tutorial was the air dash. So that should have been drilled into his head. Okay, so on the subject of is it a puzzle and the idea of um, figuring out a mechanic that you didn't know was a mechanic by accident. What about the infamous Mega Man X tutorialization that Ego Raptor brings up? Where you had the bee and you fall down a cliff and it kind of forces you to learn about wall jumping. I'd say that's a tutorial method, not a puzzle. But would the process of figuring it out be a puzzle for the player? Uh, mm, I'd say... I'd say no, because it's the... It's the trying to figure out, like, how to do something, not... Or not... It's the trying to figure out what options are available to them, not like how to use those options. But isn't that kind of like what a, like if you get one of those physical puzzles, those cubes that, that fall apart and you have to put them back together again, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, I think they're literally so you're, puzzle you're boxes. You're aware of all the pieces of the cube. You're just not aware of how they can go together. Right, right, right. Like, that that's a case where you're like missing a piece and like you, like, if you had a jigsaw puzzle and you like accidentally dropped one of the pieces on the floor and then you found the piece, like finding that piece isn't part of the puzzle. It's but but being that... being more pedantic about it though isn't holding a controller in your hand. You have all the buttons in front of you, similar to holding a block puzzle. Um, I guess. I, I obviously I don't think that <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly playing devil's advocate here. Cause... Right. It, this is one of those things where it's like kind of fuzzy where the line is. Right. And again, this is fairly similar to what we talked about the first stream and the second stream and probably the third, fourth, and fifth streams, uh, uh, defining what a Metroidvania is. Um, once you start putting out definitions there, you can 
start to find things that fit the definition that weren't meant by the person putting out the definition in the first place. Or like, I have the definition of a Metroidvania where it has to be an interconnected world and... Yeah, it, doesn't the player decide what a Metroidvania is, not the person who coined it? Maybe so. But like, so I decided I was going to try to quantify that and then I like wound up looking at the Super Metroid map and determined that my definition actually excluded Super Metroid. <laughs> Ironically excluded Super Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> and so to, to Master's point, <laughs> uh, what, what's his name? Mr. Parrish. I don't Jeremy Parrish, is that his first name? Yeah. Um, who some people accredit or give credit for uh, coining the phrase. Um, there's some disagreement with that. If Oliander is on the stream right now, I'm sure he'll correct us because I think he has a, a more accurate answer on that. But he thinks that Cave Story is a Metroidvania. So if he coined the term Metroidvania and he says that Cave Story is a Metroidvania, doesn't that make Cave Story a Metroidvania? No. <laughs> if, if you believe the person that coined it as final authority, does that mean that I get to determine what games are crest likes? Oh man, you need to get on that. that. You also need to like <laughs> copyright it so you can make money off of that. <laughs> the crest like review. Yeah. <laughs> this is the difficulty with trying to define anything, though. Like uh, this week on the Reddit, um, somebody posted a video that was the anatomy of the Metroidvania, and I watched the video, and it's fine. It's his opinion. <laughs> But um, I was thinking, I'm like, I, I, I thought about whether or not I would do a video like that. And I feel incapable of doing a video like that because <laughs> it's so hard to nail down exactly what it is that makes it a Metroidvania. How's it going, Metroidvania? Sorry, I'm going to mute for a second. A great slam and then stop. So anyway, it's just a fun, it's a fun subject to think about and debate. Um, I wouldn't get angry about it. <laughs> this is the biggest thing. I mean, you don't even get angry when people tell you that Dead Cells is a Metroidvania? Uh, I don't get angry, but I do think I it's I got angry enough. because I bought Dead Cells because of that. Because you thought it was a Metroidvania. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the biggest problem with, that. that is the biggest problem and the greatest argument for keeping Metroidvania pure. So on the subject of is it a puzzle, I, I think it's just, you know it when you see it. Yeah. Um, one way that you could define it is that there are, in a Metroidvania at least, um, there are four specific activities that most Metroidvanias have. You have combat, you have platforming, you have puzzles, and you have exploration. If it's not combat, platforming, or exploration, then it must be a puzzle, right? That's how we define it. <laughs> it's the other thing that you do in Metroidvania games. <laughs> how creative these bosses are and how is everybody doing retrovania is asking so would you say that was an instance of unfair difficulty because the reason you died was because you had no idea whether the fire would be above or below the perhaps thing? Uh, you know honestly at some point you have to be able to figure it out otherwise nobody would be able to beat the boss or rather the luck boss would be pure luck which would be well, appropriate since it was a slot machine. <laughs> this is true, but failing against the boss is sometimes intended. By the way, that is why Master is playing Cuphead this week, is because we wanted to talk about what makes a good boss and what makes a bad boss. Um, would we say that Cuphead has good bosses in general? Sure. Yeah, it's almost all of the games, so if it was all bad bosses, then no one would play it. Oh my god. Unless I knocked myself just, like, back into him. Unless they were just doing it for, like, masochistic reasons. Can you tell if this, uh, boss is taking damage? Yeah. Well, yeah, they flash a little bit when you hit them. 
it's not very uh, noticeable. Yeah, so, but it, like flash white. Before we jump into what makes bosses good or bad, I do want to bring up the controversy behind Cuphead when it came out. This is one of the more highly anticipated indie games because of its art style. Uh, and then when it came out, so many players got their, got completely destroyed by it because of its difficulty. Wasn't the difficulty part of the advertising? I don't know. But my question is, is would this game have any... Would it be good if it was easy? Like, the graphics are cool, but what would be left be, I mean, besides just the graphics if it was just a really easy experience? Uh, honestly, I didn't finish it. I just played a few bosses and then was like, oh, this... So you think it's not really... good even with <laughs> with the difficulty? Oh, I, I don't play a lot of just, like, straight-up platformers anymore. I want to have, like, a little bit more to it. Sure. Like, I didn't even finish Celeste. That is the reason why I prefer the Metroidvania genre. I like that combination of all four elements. Yeah, like... I've played so many platformers over the course of my life that it just doesn't feel like there's anything new when it's just a platformer. The one exception is Mega Man. I always enjoy a good Mega Man clone. Usually a Mega Man fan game of some kind. Um, but, you know, Mega Man sort of has that choice in, like built into it because of the way you go to each level. Yeah. Although there's kind of a single right choice, at least once you've beaten one of the bosses. So Retrovania thinks that many people would enjoy it if it was easy. First thing I think of is Kirby. Kirby is supposed to be the easy game. It was designed to be the easy game. Um, and I agree, it would be a different crowd. But even Kirby kind of tries to keep itself relevant to every player uh, by having the like hidden collectibles that you have to get in order to get the true endings with it and I think that you would have to add something like that to Cuphead in order to make it appeal to a wider audience but since most of it's boss fights where would you even put hidden stuff or would you do like no hit bonuses yeah that would be a choice I think I mean it could be like Kirby's Epic Yarn where you literally can't die, but you lose uh, money every time you do, so it kind of works as a high score. Um, but I don't know. It's it's just an interesting debate. That I, I think it was great that when this game came out that we opened up that debate and, and really kind of worked or went through it. But we've been through that debate, what, two weeks in a row now? So we don't necessarily have to talk about difficulty again this week. Probably more than two weeks. What makes a good boss? Was that a good boss, Master? Uh, it was okay. <laughs> it was a so-so boss. So I think there's a bunch of different factors that go into making a good boss. I and... thought that boss was just kind of tedious to fight. Yeah. All of its patterns were just like, doing the same thing repeatedly. Yeah, one thing that I don't really like in bosses was when I feel like I'm spending most of the time waiting. Even if you're technically attacking, it's just... Yeah, I think my biggest problem with this game is that you can just constantly attack, and you don't really have to think about the attacks, you just shoot constantly. You do change between whatever weapons you've decided to equip to do slightly more damage. Yeah, but that's just like, I'm a little closer, so I'm using the burst shot. So Retrovania says that uh, he doesn't like the Kirby game, or the newer Kirby games, because they're too easy, and I can agree with that. I was actually so disappointed with Kirby 64 when it released. I was a big Kirby fan growing up, and I thought that that was just way too easy. Funny how that works. Uh, on the subject of how the bosses are designed in this game, um, this game is sort of like a bullet hell except a platformer, because of the fact that you really just... It's really about dodging more than it is about attacking, and you just kind of let your attack do its thing while you dodge. Yeah. I agree. So, so in that sense, it's more like a shmup than it is a platform. In fact, yeah. I think there's literal shmup levels in this game, isn't there? Yeah, there's ones where you guys are like a plane. I 
I don't like, know. One thing that I think is important is having a variety in the way your bosses work. Like this level um, is pretty simplistic, but it's nice that it's different from the other things. Um, I think variety in general isn't something that isn't necessarily done well very often. Yeah, like, um, I think I've mentioned this before, but like Rabbi Ruby, each individual boss I think is a really, really good boss. Like, I really like games with slow projectiles and like dodging stuff and stuff like that. But then every single boss in the game is pretty much the same way. So it, it would benefit for having some more variety. Yeah, I could agree with that. They all kind of use the same bullet hell patterns. Um, and I think there's some differences. I think part of the problem is because the patterns are so incomprehensible, because they're so complex, they do sort of kind of all run together. Um, so even if the bosses do have a gimmick, it's kind of lost in the, the number of uh, patterns that they throw at you. But like, uh, the last boss that he was fighting, you pretty much were just like staying on the left side of the screen and dodging shots. Whereas this one forces you to move back and forth, so it's actually pretty good design that they alternate these two types of bosses. You don't oh. want, you don't want anybody to fall into a dominant strategy. Right. And if you have a bunch of similar types of bosses, then you're basically training the player to fight them all in a certain way. Which I guess you could like switch it up towards the end to subvert expectations. Yeah, that was actually something I enjoyed. And this doesn't have anything to do with bosses, but um, something I hated about Breath of the Wild is you have those shrines, right? And I think 20 of them are test your strength shrines where you have to fight a single enemy in a room that's really strong and they're slightly yeah, different they're like almost the same thing they're almost the same thing they're slightly different sometimes harder sometimes not depending on what order you go in uh and then the dlc comes out and they had a test of strength level and i don't uh, i'm going to go ahead and spoil it but um it completely like you expect it to be exactly the same as the other 20 that you've probably already seen if you've gone and done all the other shrines and then suddenly it does something crazy, and I was just like, okay, Nintendo. That was almost worth going through all 20 of those other shrines just for you to trick me there. <laughs> <laughs> On that same token, though, I hate the fact that, um, that that much of the content is, uh, is basically just repetition. Certainly it's, it's better than a lot of games, but... It's the problem with like the open worldedness is that since people can do it in any order and you want everyone to do combat shrines and you kinda have to put them everywhere. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So they had to make a ton of them and they couldn't put that much work in them. I, I think and it was probably a literally filler. <laughs> yeah. Like that's ultimately what open world games are, is just they put as much filler into the game as possible. Right. And I think that's why I didn't like Breath of the Wild as much as the other Zelda games. So Retrovania says, Patterns and moves are best when you have to do a specific thing to dodge it, have to learn it, but it has to be fair to dodge. Um, I don't know if the word telegraphing is what best describes that. Okay, how did that hit me? The uh, hurt box so was active when he goes into the, the foreground, he's way bigger than he is in the background. <laughs> but you can't tell that before he does it. Yeah, his his hurt box becomes active before the visuals. Before you thought the visuals were. <laughs> yeah, don't you know how perspective works? Conveying when things are closer to you, they're bigger. I mean, it looks like he's <laughs> five inches away from me. <laughs> But it's not 3D, so you, it's obviously your perspective is wrong. Of course. Probably could have parried his glove, but I ended up not trying that. So, 
on that subject, uh, I think conveyance is actually a really important factor in game design in general. Um, and I always use uh, Wonder Boy 3, A Dragon's Trap, to uh, uh, as an example. That game comes with the original graphics, and then you can play with the animated graphics. And because of the extra animations they added to the, the new graphics, the game feels better because it feels like it's giving you more information that's helpful. Is this now a shoot 'em up because I'm in a plane? It kind of functions like a shoot 'em up, but like Gradius. Um, it's pretty much but when I'm on the ground, goal. it's not a shoot 'em up. <laughs> it, it's just kind of sort of a shoot 'em up when you're on the ground. Like, maybe? And that was definitely a shoot. So, yeah, telegraphing gives you an opportunity to know an attack is coming before it happens. I think they've done studies. There's a certain um, threshold that the human brain has not been proven to be capable of reacting to it. And you yeah. don't want your game to fall into that threshold when you throw an attack at somebody. Otherwise, it feels unfair and random. The thing with a lot of these attacks is that you don't know what they do until they do it, and then they just hit you really fast, and you have to know for next time. Yeah, when, when there's a long telegraph, you don't know the timing. Yeah. So it's just because it's telegraph it's doesn't mean you know what the telegraph means. Yeah, it's only useful after the first time. So to bring up a game we rarely ever talk about, um, Dark Souls often have these big, giant arenas with their bosses, so you can kind of keep your distance and kind of dodge away, and then you can kind of watch what they do and get some experience just watching them before... They start doing screws. Yeah, that's why I don't like attacks that. Um, like, there's some games like uh, Addo had a lot of enemies that had attacks, like melee attacks that covered pretty much the whole screen and mm. came out extremely fast once the like startup of them was. I think Otto did a pretty good job making the arenas large enough, though, that you can kind of do the Dark Souls thing and kite them and kind of watch what they do. It's harder to make a good arena in a 2D game. Yes and no. Um, I think like either, you, either you can completely like kite the enemy, or there's not enough room for you to. You like here, you know. I don't know that his horn thing just does that until he does it. But sure. like, there's no, there's not really room for me to observe what he's going to do. Yeah. So that's one of the examples of a really long-range melee attack. I'm that... going to argue that it's sort of a puzzle. <laughs> uh, his eyes are really starry and they look really mean um, maybe not staying in his line of sight is a good idea if you just want to kind of observe what he's doing but you don't know when the attack is going to come out or what direction it's going to go sure that's true I mean I guess he could uh, make the attack and it could go diagonal and you wouldn't know that I mean Right here, he has a bow. He's obviously going to shoot the bow forward. Sure. But then, but, but could he just yeah, do that? And then they don't really shoot forward. So that's one of the reasons I like slow projectiles is because they can come out immediately, but you can still see where they are and where they're going and react to them after they've already come out. So I've always had this idea for a game that stars a superhero, and the theming is that everything moves slower for the superhero, and that's why bullets move slowly across the screen and still hurt you when they touch you. So wouldn't that just be like if you were, if it was the Flash from the Flash's perspective? Right, right, right. That's kind of super hot. Yeah, super hot's really. That's a really cool game. I like that idea. So uh, what we're describing here, though, when, when the enemy does something that you couldn't possibly know what it was until it happens, that's the uh, trial and error gameplay that people complain about. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask a controversial question. Is there anything wrong with trial and error gameplay? Uh, I mean, not necessarily. This game is kind of, kind of based around that idea, I so guess the, you could say. The main advantage of trial and error gameplay is that 
it actually reduces the difficulty of the game over time. So like, people do say that this game is really hard, but that's just like, it takes a lot of tries to actually win. Um, but you're probably gonna act, you're probably eventually gonna be able to figure it out. And then the other question I'm going to have is, is that unfair? Or is trial and, un get, trial and error gameplay unfair? So, yeah, I, I think it's unfair, but I'm not... I'm saying that there's actually some positives to it anyway. Like, it's not necessarily wrong for a game to be unfair. So Retrovinia says, trial and error feels bad when it's some boss uh, in a gauntlet that's far in. And I think that the punishing yeah. factor is really important. If you're going to have trial and error style gameplay, you need to give you need to give the player tries so they can trial. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. My, yeah, that was my biggest problem with the Hollow Knight Pantheons, is that you would fight a bunch of um, repeat bosses, and then they'd throw a brand new boss at you right at the end. So you're probably going to die to that boss once. Sure. And then you have to redo the entire gauntlet. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically this, but a lot longer, and then it feels more tedious, especially if you feel like you've completely mastered the earlier parts. Yeah, since the phases are so different, this game kind of has that. Yeah. Obviously, not as much time is involved. So I think one of the important things about having phase bosses like this that you have to start over from scratch is how well can you optimize each phase? Um, True. Now, that kind of goes against this game's design of basically uh, being focused on just dodging the whole time because there really isn't a way to optimize it other than I this time I kept this shooting him in the face bit. more. <laughs> but otherwise, this is ultimately just a platforming waiting game. Yeah. And yeah, I, like, I, I do like optimizing bosses when I can try to like find new ways to squeeze out more damage. But this is just not a game where you can do that. And I'll acknowledge that Sphere Korriban was basically saying what we were talking about with the uh, um, having to redo it is is a problem. And I think it's something that needs to be considered. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I agree, Retrovania. I had never enjoyed the, the games that have these boss rushes. I've never been able to like sit down and, and do them. So you say that you can practice out the statues, but you have to actually reach them once before you can practice them. Hmm. So you... That's like you're pro assuming that you can't beat it on the first try, which is extremely unlikely that you do that. You have to play it at least twice, and the whole thing at least twice. Oh my god! Okay, so Cuphead's bosses are most definitely supposed to be um, played trial and error style. Like, you, you do it a couple of times, you learn the patterns, uh, you either memorize the patterns or, you know, get better at recognizing telegraphing. Uh, how would you do a boss that is not meant to be... not meant to be played multiple times to learn the patterns? Like, what is a what is an example of a good boss that isn't pattern-based? I mean, pretty much all bosses are pattern-based. To some to degree, some I agree. Um, but some of, like not all of them are required that you use trial and error to get through the path. I'm trying to think of a boss that you can't use trial and error to get through. It would have to be one that like has completely random attack patterns. And then when it's completely random, it's really not that fun usually. Yeah, oftentimes it isn't. Um, I think the telegraphing would have to be very, very good in order to do that. I don't like this phase. You jump to the right, and then he immediately does the pollen, and there's not really room to land. Hmm. Well, if it, if a boss is completely random, then telegraphing doesn't do anything for you. Right, right. Because you don't know what they're going to telegraph. Well, if, I think if a boss is completely random, then telegraphing is crucial, right? Otherwise, it would never, it wouldn't be possible. It'd be a gamble. So you can have a um, boss with purely random like bullet patterns, as long as they're, like once again slow projectiles, um, as long as you have enough time to react to the bullet pattern. 
Yeah, a slow projectile is kind question. of like a really slow telegraph. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, I think. Try to parry the seed that's falling from the sky. If another seed just happens to fall, if you've moved to the left or right and it hits you, that's kind of random. Because they fall in random places. Yeah. But the seeds are slow projectiles. So you can get away with it. Basically, there's a lot of the stuff you can get away with with slow projectiles that you can't get away with with any other kind of attack. Right, except if you try to parry it and it's like on the top of the screen, you can't see it coming. What do you think this guy's doing with his hands? Dancing. I guess those hands hurt you, so I guess <laughs> he's stabbing the air. Oops. That was good. Probably being quiet to help Master out. Yeah, the other thing is that there's no life bar for the bosses. So, like. Only when you die. So, if you've done the boss before, you know how close you are to beating it. Yeah, usually. So, Fargo Corcon, we're actually playing Cuphead because we were going to talk about what makes a boss good or bad. Which applies to Metroidvanias, but we we're also joking. There was a there was a magazine that put this in their top ten Metroidvania games, which I thought was kind of amusing. I have no idea how you could even justify this as a Metroidvania. <laughs> like uh, you get new abilities from the shop, I guess. And then that makes the other enemies easier. I've I've seen the argument that getting abilities somehow makes it a Metroidvania automatically, and I don't really understand the. The mentality behind that. I mean, games always have abilities pretty much in the present day because they think they need progression systems to keep the player entertained and feel like they're actually progressing. And I guess you could say, if you're being cynical, that this is because the games themselves are have less quality or don't feel like. You know, they don't, don't feel like they have progression if they didn't have these progression systems in them. I don't know if that's true. That's a whole it's other like, subject. <laughs> we can go to that subject. like we know what uh, alt account Etcero has now. <laughs> Etcero has all the accounts. I thought it was Seamus that had all the accounts. I don't remember. Nancy Drews or Petrovania's. A great time <laughs> oh, I love the background. It is a cool background. I think it's intentionally distracting. Oh, yeah, it's definitely intentionally distracting. <laughs> so, on the subject of progression systems... Is there a, a game you can think of that has no progression systems that is good I mean plenty oh, of Super Mario Brothers linear platformers don't have progression yeah Super Mario Brothers doesn't really well like they unlock more levels usually you get you I think oh, ever right. since Super Mario Brothers 3 they had some kind of um, completion progression where you do specific levels and lock up other levels or you can skip levels if you do things correctly. That's existed since the oh, first Mario Brothers. Yeah, a any game that has levels, you unlock a level every time you beat a level until the end. Sure, the Mario's <laughs> Mario's always had like secrets though that you could find, like warp warp zones and things like that. But they don't give you any like progression. They just unless you consider like extra lives to be progression. Zero brought up Tetris. So let's think about like in the action platformer genre though. And I guess that's probably true. Those linear platforms are probably good examples of that. Anything like Mario or Donkey Kong or Raymond. But the scores don't make you more powerful. That'd be interesting. Oh. Can you make a Tetris game that you get more powerful as you uh, get a higher score? And then like the blocks get harder somehow? I had two life there, right? 
Somebody needs to make a progression based Tetris game. I don't know. Did you oh, take two damage? Shifting bits is making that Metroidvania. Oh, I yeah. actually considered making a like Metroidvania that had uh, like actual Tetris as the core mechanic. Sarah was being attacked by the auto mod. <laughs> oh, no. I don't. I don't think scores are progression. So one of the biggest differences between an open world game and a Metroidvania, in my opinion, is that in a, an open world game you can find things and they don't necessarily do anything. In a Metroidvania, generally speaking, when you find something, it makes you more powerful, or at the very least, it expands your options. Well, it has a combination of things like currency. Or, like, um, there's also just straight up weapon pickups like uh, Castlevania. Currency is essentially just custom customizable upgrades. Like, you go into the shop and you choose which one you want right now. Equipment could be considered customizable upgrades. Yeah, that, like, the things you get in um, open world games are generally a lot of side grades, but there's still side grades in Metro Games. Yeah, I think a lot of puzzle games like. Um, Minesweeper was brought up. Uh, it doesn't have any progression, and I think that that's true. Okay, so Baba is you. Does that have progression? Is unlocking levels progression? I think we've decided that not, that it is not progression in the context of what we're talking about. Yeah, I think as soon as you say unlocking levels is progression, then any, almost every game in existence has progress. Uh, so Belfast Belmont just linked um, refac refactor refac refac refactor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever tried to pronounce that out loud. <laughs> I know which game it is. You can actually talk to the developer on the uh, our Metroidvania Discord if you're interested. They uh, they hang out there. Although I haven't heard them talk in a while. Could be busy. Turns out that developing a game is a lot of work. Yeah. I don't like that last phase. I think you said that about every last phase. <laughs> <laughs> are you supposed to like the last phase, or are you supposed to be just relieved that it's over? A new team is going to call this video the last phase hater. <laughs> I mean, I said that much about last phases, have I? Uh, I think you said it like at least twice, maybe three times. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> at least it's not one of those last phases where it's just like the boss is invincible the whole time, spraying projectiles everywhere, and you just have to wait oh, gosh. until they're done. I kind of like when there's a last phase where it's like kind of a last ditch attempt of the boss to kill you. So to answer uh, Melfis Belmont's question, Master's the one who's playing. Yes. La Mulana, not to like spoil some of the bosses, but there's a time or two perhaps where you kill the boss and then they they kill you when you think they're dying. Don't you hate it when you can't talk about a boss because you feel like it's spoiling them? Yeah, I actually just did a boss like that in La Mulana too, and I'm like this guy's totally gonna do something, and then I like got as far away from him as possible, and then he did the thing, and I wasn't able to react to it in time. And still died. It's kind of cheap, but I kind of like it anyways. It's weird. Okay, so like, I'd rather that than just have a really annoying last phase. I want to mention that I normally hate wave-based situations like this. Um, I usually this find isn't very long. Tedious. What's that? This just doesn't take very long, so I don't mind it. I'm going to say that it's actually genius here, though, because I think the parry mechanic is one of those things... Okay, so when I play Blasphemous uh, for 14 episodes, um, I got to the end and I still wasn't good at parrying, and that's because the game doesn't really require you to do it. Now, Calderas going to say, no, wait a minute, that's what makes the game too easy. And why yeah, I don't like it. it's not that um, you have to use it. It's just it's such a powerful option. It's really good, but I was never yeah. forced to use it. And I don't really right. like parrying. 
because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> like the only so reason that also, I, that also brings up the issue of when the most powerful option in your game isn't fun. Um, because then the optimal play is the not fun play. Okay, there were some situations where you parry against those DLC bosses that I thought were great. Um, and it felt good to do it, and I think they did a great job with it. Yeah. Uh, there's times that a parrying does feel good, and there's times that it doesn't. No, I will completely agree that... So, it's good to have enemies before a boss that force you to get good at a mechanic before you have to use it on the boss. And the enemies that are like that in Blasphemous are terrible and I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> they are the most boring enemies in the game because the only thing you can do is parry them in order to get past them. Um, so when, they were forced to do it but then you didn't really take the lesson to heart after you were forced to do it. Sure, and plus uh, I'm going to say that because they're not very good enemies, I think the developers realized that and they kind of didn't have them after the first couple of areas of the game. Now, I'm going to go back in circles here, because uh, the whole thing that sparked this thought was those uh, parry rooms in Cuphead. Those are, they seem like optional challenges. I, I think you could probably beat the game without doing them, but you get rewards for doing them. Am I correct in that assessment? I can't uh, parry the pink guys. I tried twice and I took damage both times. Hmm. It looked like I parried purple them. guys, not pink guys. You should know the difference. Like that guy. So yeah, Melfus Belmont is actually circling back to exactly what I was getting at. Uh, those gauntlet rooms are all about getting you used to doing parries um, so that when you get to the boss, it's something that you remember is in your kit. Uh, the worst thing a developer can do is put something in your kit and then never force you to use it enough that it becomes intentional. They use the word intentionality as the game design buzzword. Like time spinner with the time stop? Yeah, yeah. Time Spinner, I went the entire game without time stopping. <laughs> like, but that's partially because the game didn't really implement it into its level design. Like the opposite example of that is Toho Luna Nights, which did a fantastic job making you use it all the time. Yeah. Uh, another thing about Time Spinner, and this is just me, like I'm always analyzing economies and, and currencies and things like that, just because that's what I do for my day job. Um, you're actually punished for using time, uh, time stopping power in Time Spinner because the game is programmed so that the candles will give you gold if you're at full time power. But if you're at less than full time power, instead of gold, it will give you time power. Yeah. I Which on that. paper seems like a decent idea because it gives you an easy way to get your time power back. But in execution, it punishes you for using time power because now you're not getting money when you break those candles. <laughs> right. Can you parry that head? Probably um, not. I mean, okay. maybe. The whole boss is pink, so it's kind of impossible to tell. <laughs> and if you try, it's then uh, you lose your life and you die. So. It's not pink, it's magenta. Oh. Oh yeah, this is... The weird thing about this boss is it isn't just like randomly choosing attacks, it's randomly choosing the phases. And so, like, some of the phases are easier than others in different orders. Yeah, so that makes it uh, random how hard it is. Yeah. So Melfis Belmont said um, that a game has to be hard enough in order to force you to use your tools. I don't know if difficulty is what I would say... I mean, if you're, if you're using the tools intentionally, uh, or if you have intentionality when you're using those tools, it doesn't even have to be difficult. You just have to be able to do them when the game asks you to. And if the game never asks you to, you're just not going to do it. And then you can't enjoy the fun of using that mechanic. And then if the game asks you to do it after a long time, then you forgot that you can do it. Then it's like a bad telegraph. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are unable to react because you don't know what button to push, not because you weren't able to react. And I run into a, game, a lot of games that feel like that for me. <laughs> this boss is making weird screaming sounds, and I keep thinking it's yeah, my kids Harry in the does background. Not work. <laughs> it does not work, okay. I keep thinking it's my kids in the background. 
And I keep wanting to put myself on mute. They I'm like, no like way, that. it's the boss. <laughs> Let's see, Castlevania. So I don't like this the phase either. It seems like it's pretty stressful. Because you're constantly having to dodge in like a bunch of different directions, multiple things. I imagine you could get yourself kind of trapped in a bad spot if you just happened to be unlucky and the head was in the wrong spot when you were having to jump over or something. Yeah, have I mentioned on this yet the um, the boss of the demo of Eterna Noctis, where it's like this giant slime that has this attack that like puts a bunch of stuff like there's a bunch of dripping slime that covers the floor and then it just lingers there for a while, but then while it's lingering you have to dodge attacks and um, oh bad zones that you have to deal with. Sorry, what was that? I call those bad zones where. You uh, you don't want to be there, but um, like you don't want to be in that area because you're either going to take damage or you get slowed down or whatever. But then you're saying that the, he throws attacks at you that kind of force you to be in those areas, or yeah. So that if you get the wrong set of atta like attacks combined together, then it becomes actually impossible to dodge all of them. This all reminds me of this one boss in Salt and Sanctuary. That just... It had the worst RNG ever. And sometimes it would do attacks from like off-screen and you couldn't even hit it. My controversial uh, just, opinion is I don't feel that the bosses in Salt and Sanctuary are generally that fantastic. It was called the Witch of the Lake. Do you remember it? I do remember the Witch of the Lake. That one is one where you kind of go in and you burst her down as quickly as you can so she can't do anything. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the one that everyone complains about. Or it says like it's super hard. You better have a build where you can burst thing burst her down quickly because the faster you get her down, the more likely you're going to survive. Yeah, she has one attack that just kind of destroys you. Yeah. So apparently, there you can look in the um, in the like bestiary and see how many times you've died died to any given enemy. Oh. So like somebody was on the Facebook group like. Oh hey, here was my list of how long or how many deaths I had to each boss, and then I went and checked it, and I'm like, <laughs> I have like five at the most for any of these, and most of these are ones or zeros. Yeah, part of the overall... sanctuary is the builds aren't particularly balanced either. Like if you go with the Warhammer build, you're kind of going to have a really easy time. Yeah, I used a great sword, I think, the whole time. I made it really easy to hit things. This is true of all the Souls-like games. Big bursty weapons tend to be better because you can spend more time dodging and get your hits in when you can. Anything that requires you to stay there and hit the enemy multiple times in order to layer in your damage doesn't help you very much. Pretty much all of the bosses in those Souls-like games are just like... Oh, you're about to do an attack? I better roll behind you and then hit you from behind. Hit them in the back, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that ever changed. I haven't played. I haven't finished Dark Souls 3. It's kind of true uh, of Bloodborne as well, too. You, you get behind people and you're kind of set. This is why people say that uh, Devil May Cry is still better than Dark Souls. And also, like, in goes. 2D games, they usually let you roll through the boss. Mm. So it's just literally just like... You roll, you're behind them, and uh, that's all you have to do. Depends on the boss. 2D games have the option of, um, because you're usually, you usually have some kind of verticality, they can get out of your reach and require you to jump to get to them. So playing a... No, I'm not saying that, Sero. <laughs> that Sero is here to troll that <laughs> genre <laughs> definition. <laughs> I'm sorry if I, I kind of lost track of the uh, the stream chat there. It is on display for anybody watching this as a VOD or a, on YouTube. So I apologize if I missed that conversation there. Hopefully it doesn't scroll too fast. Uh, 
So the clouds are actually smaller than they look, and you can phase through the side of it. Oh no, and that's not good. On it. Conveyance. <laughs> yeah, that's usually one of the problems with the 2.5D games, but you still get that problem in the like, purely hand-drawn one. So Retrovania brought up something interesting to talk about, and that is um, a good a good type of boss is the type that requires you to basically play a different, completely different gameplay specific to that boss. Um, and he mentions like a pure puzzle boss. I'm going to use Dark Souls as an example, or Demon Souls in this case. There's the Dragon God in Demon Souls. Has everybody played Demon Souls on this stream? I played it. So there's a boss yeah, in that I've game where. So long. What's that? I've been so long. I think I do remember what you do with that boss. I actually played it like a couple of years ago. I guess it's been two years. But we're going through all the Souls likes. We started with Demons again. So I played it fairly recently. Anyway, there's a boss in that game that. Um, most of the bosses, you run behind them and you, you whack them in their back, like uh, Calderoff <laughs> was saying. This one, uh, you can't attack it until you um, nail it down. I think that's wrong. I think you can actually get out a bow and shoot it to death, but that would take forever. I think there's other ways to kill it um, besides that. But the way, the best way to kill it is, for whatever reason, it's hanging out in an arena that has two big ballistas in it. And you shoot the two ballistas at it, and that nails it down to the ground, and then you can hit it in the face. Um, so it's just kind of a nice change-up, or an interesting change-up. Some people hate it, uh, because it's not the game that they signed up for. That's, like, that's, dude, like a, that's a dumb argument. I feel that way with sometimes when games do that. Like, um, I was playing one game that requires you to basically play Space Invaders and get a high enough score in order to progress with the game. I'm like, I was playing a Metroidvania, but I guess I'm playing Space Invaders now. Wait, which game was that? Uh, I'm not going to mention the name. <laughs> um, was it did you see that hitbox button? on the uh, orb? Yeah, and I, I think we should re-roll re the tape there. So in Sonic Mania, apparently there's a Poyo Poyo boss in Sonic Mania. I think that's great. Part of that is, I don't really like the bosses in Sonic anyway, usually. <laughs> now granted, I have not played Sonic Mania. For all I know, the bosses in Sonic Mania are amazing, but generally speaking, Sonic only has kind of... They're throwaway bosses. They're there to, you know, be a capstone on the level. So yeah, there are, uh, going back to bosses that are, like change up the game mechanics, there's actually a few of them where they just like wait until the very final boss to do that. Like, the original Devil May Cry, uh, the last phase of the boss in the cathedral. That can be cool. I'm trying to remember yeah. what happened in Devil May Cry. It's been so long since I played that one. Did you see that unavoidable damage? I did see that unavoidable damage. It seems like using your super attack is not a good idea on this boss. Yeah. I'm now, still gonna do it, though. If I'm, in, <laughs> if I'm incorrect, or if I'm correct, can you do, like, the giant... Uh, Hadoukens instead of the big spray? I don't think I have that. Oh, you mean just the normal supers? Yeah, I'll yeah. try. I think that might be a better... Because it seems like getting frozen is, is bad. I like that you at least have that option. Um, yeah, unless I fill it up accidentally from, like, parrying multiple times in a row. Something that's really amateur that I see in a lot of, like, uh, of the more amateur games that I play um, is the game will like trigger an event that causes an animation, but it doesn't stop the gameplay from happening. And so like, I can't do anything because it's playing the cutscene. But in the meantime, this zombie's gnawing on my face and taking all my HP down while the game is in cutscene mode. That's kind of like what's happening with that super. There's actually some hilarious stuff that happens in some um, like RPGs where you're having conversations with somebody and an enemy comes by and just like <laughs> tackles you in the middle of it even if it doesn't do any damage we're playing world of warcraft Actually, on a pvp server while you're in the middle of a quest <laughs> i really don't like this final phase <laughs> because it has still projectiles isn't it our metroidvania podcast episode 14 final phase hater <laughs> No, don't tell FaZe that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
That is way too inside for anybody who's not on the Discord. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a joke uh, involving riffs so we can make it even more inside. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I like how that dude's hat can also damage you. So, Belfast Belmont was saying that the uh, um, the super attack is a recovery thing. You know, I'm going to say that I don't mind it. The super attack is lagging in this game because you do have control over it and you do have that alternative using those Hadoukens instead. Um, but I, I'm talking about bosses that, like... Like, let's say there's a boss that has... Oh, well, we'll take the Dragon God boss in uh, Demon Souls as an example. Imagine if there was, like, a bullet hell going on at the same time and when you flip the switch to hit the Ballista... And while the ballista is firing and you can't do anything, the bullet hell is still going on and damaging you. That's kind of what's happening in some of these games that I play. Yeah, I've actually had bosses where I like killed them, and then during the like, the hey, cuts. you killed the boss cutscene, they're like, I get hit by a projectile. Yeah, Mega Man One had that problem, and I think they fixed it in Mega Man Two. Then when you kill a boss, it also destroys all projectiles on the screen at the same time. That's game design 101, guys. <laughs> or you just make it so your characters are invincible, or at least can't take damage during cutscenes. Or if your you know, boss... That was pretty garbage, wasn't it? Yeah, you're pretty close. If a Sorry, boss I'm just a... like interrupting the not game talk with me complaining about this game. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard not to. If, you're a, uh, if your boss has a bottomless pit in the arena, put a cover over that pit when you defeat them. <laughs> yeah. How's it going, Silver? Uh, someone I watched, they were playing Environmental Station Alpha, and they uh, beat a certain boss, and then they just yeeted themselves off the map right afterwards. <laughs> And how to redo the boss. Okay, so I'm complaining about this. Okay, Environmental Station Alpha has some of my favorite bosses in the entire genre. However, it commits the sin uh, that there are a couple of bosses that you have to pay attention after you kill it because there are things in the arena that will kill you. <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. And then there's also the case of you have to get back to a save point after <laughs> killing the boss. And Those it doesn't usually kill your health. Them. Oh yeah, Castlevania. The old Castlevania games have a lot of that going on. Or, La uh, or in La Mulana, like you beat a boss and then you're like, I don't really want to go all the way back to the save point and or teleport back to the save point and then walk all the way back here. So you like go forward and then you just instantly die to a death trap for some reason. So in every Metroidvania game I play, when I beat a boss, I always backtrack to the boss be previous. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because of La Mulana. Uh, no, it's just <laughs> every game, it seems like I always get punished if I don't, so... <laughs> La Mulana, you can just instantly teleport after you. It doesn't even have to be La Mulana. But you have to walk back. In all of the Egavanias, I'll do the same thing. And as it turns out, Portrait oh, of Ruin has a glitch where if you beat a boss and then you backtrack to the save point and save and go back into the boss room, it soft blocks you into the boss's room and you can't progress the game. That's wow. amazing. <laughs> so, uh, it's funny. I, I think that it has to be specific triggers that uh, cause it. It doesn't happen every time, but... So yeah, is your save just boss. completely borked at that point? Yeah, there's a YouTuber... Um, what is his name? P. Caspery. Uh, who has a good video about it. I recommend checking it out if you're interested in this. Yeah, I think in other releases of the game it has been fixed. So another thing I wanted to talk about with uh, good bosses and bad bosses, in Metroidvania games, I think if your game has any kind of meaningful progression that makes you more powerful it's very important that you don't put the person into a position where they have to fight that boss like if they're locked into that situation which apparently it's super metroid commits this sin and i didn't know that like if you save in turian at the end of the game you're apparently stuck there forever like your your file is locked into that location I actually never knew that, because <laughs> I've never actually, like, I, I've never gone to Turian without 
the thought in my head, I am now going to go complete this game. I am done. Um, but apparently if you save in there, your file is stuck in there forever. I can't remember. Can you copy files in Super Metroid? I think you should, more games should have copyable files. Maybe. Well, yeah, that's also the like primary complaint about the death system in Hollow Knight, where you're not actually completely locked, but you're effectively locked into fighting that boss repeatedly until you've beaten it, or you're going to lose all your geo. Does the geo appear outside of the arena in Hollow Knight? I think it does. A lot of them it appears inside the arena. Does it? Oh, I don't remember that. That's annoying. <laughs> I agree, and I think that that's one of the big controversial things about Hollow Knight is the death mechanics. Thing. There we go. Jesus Christ. You got him. <laughs> but like, there's like no warning. It's just like, oh, suddenly dead. Yeah, that's it's just like, thank you. I think we already <laughs> listened to that as a complaint about this game. So it's Sarah says that that was the hardest boss in the game. Good to know. So uh, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. <laughs> here goes. Wow. Uh oh. Look at gimmick. Oh, I can't. B -b 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 -b. Oh, I think gimmicks awful. are very important. They are important. Without gimmicks, what do you have? Yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> so, on the subject of progression, and um, I think. Somebody mentioned progression as it making the game easier? I think that it can make the game harder, or at least more complex. Like, I think in Environmental Station Alpha, things like the dash... <laughs> I have had to spend more time allowing your, your messages at Cero <laughs> than anybody else that's ever been on our stage. <laughs> hey, if you didn't troll so much, I don't know what would be nicer to you. Can you guys hear the game volume? Yeah, we can. They can hear because the game Because that squeaking noise. Oh my god, that's horrible. <laughs> anyway, I was saying that the progression systems could actually make things harder. Like, I think the game is enabled to be a substantially harder after you get the dash ability in Environmental Station Alpha than previous to when you had that power. Uh, progression so system. So it can be, like, can make it harder if it's, like, used that way. But there's games that definitely come easier as you progress, especially sure. in Metroidvanias. Like, I think it's important that Metroidvanias do become harder as you go. Sorry for interrupting. So, like, examples would be, like, Escape from Tethys and every Castlevania game becomes significantly easier. I like that about Escape from Tethys, though. I like starting out that it's really, really difficult, and then you suddenly become, like, this godlike being by the end of the game. There's something fun about that. Now I'll agree that it kind of... I don't even know what you're supposed to do there. Oh, you're supposed to dash. I guess that makes sense. There's something fun about that, and I'll agree that it doesn't necessarily provide a challenge, but sometimes it's just fun to... Like... Don't know how to avoid the duck. Yeah, it seems a little difficult. Also, the hitboxes on the cars are very weird. Can you just shoot the duck? No, I probably can. I just didn't try that. Because, you know, it's in a line of uh, things you have to avoid. But yeah, a lot of what um, Metroidvanias oh, do... Oh, I can, but only it's head. Oh, well that solves that. <laughs> that makes that much easier. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, a lot of the appeal of Metroidvanias for a lot of people is the power fantasy. Um, and that's what you get when you make the game easier as you go along. Sure, and even when you do that, they could still subvert that. So in general, like, as you progress through a Metroidvania game, going back to earlier areas, you should have that feeling that you've overcome this. Uh, like, for instance, Environmental Station Alpha. When you when you get the dash and things like that earlier, different areas feel much easier than the first time you went through them. And I think that that's a crucial design piece of the Metroidvania. 
Um, they could have an escape from Tethys, included a final boss, that in spite of all of your abilities, it was your match. Yeah, like, I actually got to the final boss in Escape from Tethys and then beat it on my first try, and it was like, oh. I, did I did you end up getting the uh, um, the secret room item? Uh, I did. Okay, so, yeah, I think... And the fact that that was optional and kind of really well hidden, uh, relatively speaking... Well, I didn't get it at the point that I beat him the first time. Oh, okay. Well, I... Like, the first time I basically just stumbled on him and then killed him, and, and I guess it's... And I'm going to argue that the flaw is more on the design of that final boss and less on the progression causing that problem. I would agree. Because I think there are plenty of games that when you get all of your powers, you still have a boss that... Um, even though you can tell that you have come so far in your power... Uh, the boss proves that there's still more that you lack, and that's kind of a trope that works well with video games, and it's fun. Yeah, I think the game would have definitely benefited from like a secret boss or something like that, or like that's the other or, option. Like, is. Yeah, or like Demon's Crest, where if you 100%, then it has a has more phases at the end. What? Not that that's the best boss as an example, but. <laughs> From a design perspective, what the my favorite boss in the game? The final, the final secret boss? No, not not that one. I'm talking about the hundred percent boss. No, no, no. The hundred percent boss, I'm sure, is fine. It's the one that you get after you start over again. You have the super form that has all the other abilities. Yeah, that one's fair. I like secret bosses. Um, I think they add a lot to the game. They do. Secrets are good. More secrets, please. Secrets in general are good. I think if you have a Metroidvania and you don't have secrets, you aren't a Metroidvania anymore and I, you don't belong <laughs> yes. in our discussions. <laughs> Does the message I'm being want? facetious, but... <laughs> but the secrets should not necessarily be mandatory. Right, exactly. Well, that's what makes it a secret. But La Lana has mandatory secrets. I don't think that... La Mulana has any optional secrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's just agreeing with me really hard there. <laughs> um, I don't know. Did I, did I just say that I, I, I think that they should be optional? <laughs> La Mulana is kind of a weird case. Beating that game is kind of a secret. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like though Dallas the Dark Calls final boss. I should stream that game sometime. And yes, it was a huge difficulty jump. It felt like I was playing Zelda 2 all of a sudden. Pretty sure this area is just designed to be as annoying as possible. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this game is designed to just be as annoying as possible. Yeah, that's true. Don't, don't deal with the devil, or whatever so, the tagline is. So what's the difference between being annoying and being difficult? Uh, probably tedium. Mm. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, the easy definition is when you stop having fun. <laughs> <laughs> but what causes that, that's, that's something that I'm thinking about. So I'd say that in this case, the annoyance is the punishment of having to play through the whole level again, rather than like the actual challenge of playing the level. Okay, so something that ruins Dark Souls for a friend of mine is the fact that when you die to a boss, you usually have a pretty decent amount of space that you have to cover in order to get back to the boss. Yeah. Ruins the that's game also, for him. That's also a complaint that I've had friends say about Hollow Knight. Like yeah, I heard that quit playing. Game, especially on the So what boss. was I supposed to do there? Yeah, runbacks are an interesting thing with 
game, sometimes they're good, and then sometimes people really hate them. Yeah, like, I remember in Demon Souls having a lot of instances where I was, like, actually just speedrunning, like, to figure out, like, to get back to losses. So I'd be optimizing their route at the same time, and that was actually probably more fun to me than actually fighting the boss. Optimizing the route to the boss, that's kind of where I, my feeling is on Dark Souls, is that I do get some fun out of trying to get back as quickly as possible. It, for me, it depends on the area. Yeah, like, it needs to be a route that's fun to optimize. Right. So and it's I, just, like, a straight line and... Like, you have to kill some enemies. Like, especially if you have to kill enemies that have a lot of health, then it gets really repetitious. Yeah, if you absolutely have to kill them, which is usually rarely the case in Dark Souls. You can usually run past anything in that game that isn't behind a fog door. So, I, I do want to quickly say that everybody in the comments are giving you all kinds of suggestions on how to play Master. <laughs> okay. My favorite I way mean... is to get good. Um... <laughs> Uh, but they're saying that there's some things in the shops that might make it easier. I think Melfus Belmont mentioned that there's a dash ability that makes it so you're invincible when you're dash, which... Yeah, I thought about grabbing that, but then I realized, you know, that's making it easier for myself. <laughs> I, knew that, I knew that that would be but, something that you would say. <laughs> but but one, didn't buying the spread shot also make it easier? I mean, it kind of makes it harder because then I have to manage something else. <laughs> It also it doesn't really increase my damage by that much. You're one of those self-destruction players. It. See, I'm really bad. Like, if I see something that makes the game easier, I immediately grab it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those people that you give the player the opportunity, they'll optimize the fun out of everything. That is me to the T. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I have to think about when I'm evaluating games on whether or not you could still have fun with the game if you didn't do what I do. <laughs> but yeah, I always exploit every option that's available. When I originally played Demon Souls, I beat the Armor Spider boss by sitting in a corner and shooting it with a crossbow until it died. <laughs> this yeah. hurts my I finger mean... <laughs> because I'm holding my controller and then extending... So my, in my pointer finger to hit my push to talk. Oh no. In my opinion, I think that you should just auto-fire, because there's no situation where not firing would be... Except for that dragon boss. ...useful. Is there a situation in that dragon boss where you don't want to fire your gun? Yeah, okay, if I go through here, will I just, like, die? I don't even know. I think that might be the end of the level. Okay. It's not obvious. No, it isn't. It I looks like there's a pit die. if you miss it. Well, with the last phase, if you shoot the fire things, they explode really fast with, uh, and hit a, they shoot a projectile in four directions. And that's kind of harder to avoid than just the projectile itself. I, yeah, I, when I played Bastion, I did the exact same thing. Uh, Bastion has all of these upgrades that you can have, but you also have these idols that give you more gold and stuff when you use them, or more rewards. But they also make the game harder. I also slapped on as many idols as possible. That's the thing. If the game tells me that if I play on hard mode, I'll get more gold, I will always play on hard mode. Or golden experience. Oh, so why? Um, I don't know. I'm a sucker for that stuff. Yeah, I usually do the same. Uh, Sphere Korriban says that they usually play with all of the exploits um, the first playthrough, but not after. That's absolutely true for me as well. When I was playing Dark Souls, I played a playthrough where I'm like, I'm not going to use a shield this run. No shields. I'm going to see how it is. And do you know what? Now I never play with a shield because I'm like, the game's more fun this way. It's kind of interesting that you almost always choose hard mode, but then you exploit it as much as possible. Yep. I. Well, that's why like I pick hard more mode. It's a challenge, but then you have to try harder. Yeah. To exploit it. Yeah. That's why I play on hard and mode. And part of the is challenge is finding exploit. Yeah, exactly. The reason why I started doing that is because when I played Bioshock Infinite, I talked about how boring the game was. And they're like, did you play on the hardest difficulty? I'm like, well, no. Why would I do that? And then I'm like, you know what? They got a point. <laughs> I should just play on the hardest difficulties from now on. That way I can't... You can't say that uh, I was bored because the game was too easy because I played on the easy hardest... or on the easier difficulties. That does get me in trouble a lot, though. 
Because not every hard mode is designed very well. <laughs> yeah. Now that I've stopped playing turn-based RPGs, it's I should probably play the hard modes more often because those are the most egregiously problematic games for hard modes. Sorry, what type of game? Uh, turn-based RPGs. Oh, yeah. Because it's usually just like, oh, you just have to grind more. Any game that has a leveling system, and I know it has a leveling system, I actually won't play on the most difficult mode because I know that... I know how easy it is to just lean on grinding in that situation. It's one of the thing, of one of the things I like about the Egavania games is their hard modes are level 50 maximum or level 1 maximum. That's what makes it the hard mode, and I actually think that that's a smart way to do it. Yeah. With those RPG games. <clears throat> I never like it when the game increases the amount of grind as what they call, quote, hard, unquote. I agree. I think I've mentioned it before, but, like, Crisis Core was my largest offender there, mm -hmm. where it had those uh, cinematic attacks that they just trigger every once in a while and they deal a set amount of damage. And if you're playing on hard mode and you haven't grinded it enough, then it just oh my won't God. See, if you don't know to jump onto those things, you can't really get up there. So Sphere Curve on points out that time. level 1 max in Egovania games, everything just two shots you, and that is what makes it great. <laughs> it turns <laughs> out that the the bosses in uh, those Castlevania games are actually, um, like, after REF Sorrow, I feel like Symphony of the Night didn't have the greatest bosses. I'd have to play um, Harmony of Dissonance again to kind of really analyze the bosses. I don't remember them being fantastic. But after Aria, I thought the bosses were very well designed. Um, they still have the issue of the upside down difficulty curve. That as you get further in the game, they, you tend to just kind of face tank them. But when you're forced to actually learn their patterns, they actually really have good patterns and are really well done. Wait, all the games after Area, you say? Yeah, and I'm going to say Portrait of Ruin is no, one of those games. You can't say that. That's a lie. Especially, especially the final bosses. I actually had a lot of fun. Um, getting good because I would refuse to go and grind. <laughs> I actually spent like an hour and a half trying to beat the final boss, which I cannot spoil, even though everybody knows who it is. <laughs> um, instead of going to grind instead, and I actually had fun doing that. Although I think uh, Order of Ecclesia has the, the best of them all. So I was playing uh, the Bloodless mode on Bloodstained on hard mode. Um, that actually, I felt like it revealed a bit of the problematic issues with the bosses, where you're required to use a really short range, short range weapon uh, as Bloodless, um, mm. and I didn't notice before because I was using like a great sword with Miriam, uh, but a lot of the hitboxes are pretty off, and the way the bosses move, like the contact damage you get from them, it just like. They just move in a really erratic way sometimes. So I think I said this in my review, but I feel like the uh, uh, the bosses in Bloodstained have gone back to Symphony of the Night in terms of quality. Which is really a shame because they, they nailed it in Order of Ecclesia. It has probably the best bosses in all of Castlevania. I don't know if I would necessarily say all of the classic Vania games per se. Especially taking into account the Bloodstained classic Vanias have pretty good bosses. Uh, better than the, the Metroidvania Bloodstained. This is true. So I didn't play all of that one awful Portrait of Ruin game, but you say that the bosses are good in that game. Do they get better? I played like at least, so, you, you know, know, part way through, and every single boss was terrible. The ones that stick out in my mind are the very last boss and the, the couple bosses before that. Um, and I was I was laughing there because Melfus Baumann was saying Jonathan Charlotte, Jonathan Charlotte in the uh, comments. Which is... um, so I guess if so, if you do your um, super attack and then you try jumping, like right afterwards, it won't register it. So I keep accidentally using it when I'm trying to spam it. Oh no. 
such a weird boss. All the bosses in this game are weird. So only you say only the last couple bosses are good. Does that matter more than having consistently good bosses? <sighs> okay, so... Alright, so I've said before that Ori and the Will of the Wisps, uh, I don't care for the, the bosses and the content there is. Um, and there's only five bosses in that game. And I feel like I would like Ori and the Will of the Wisps, not necessarily if they change the bosses I don't like, but more if they included more bosses to really show off the game's mechanics. And I think that if you have enough good, memorable bosses then that can make up for some not-so-good, mediocre bosses. Especially in a Metroidvania, because bosses aren't necessarily the primary attraction, especially in an Egovania. Uh, having some really good, memorable bosses with a bunch of mediocre ones is fine, I think. As long as the exploration is fun, which is another arguable aspect of Portrait of Ruin that... <laughs> And I think the main focus on in Castlevania is about variety of enemies more than quality of them. I think the most important boss you should nail is the final one, and Ori does that. Um, Cathedral does that too. Uh, the Cathedral has a couple of not so good bosses. But that final boss is maybe one of my favorite final bosses that, that I've played. Really enjoyed that final boss. I don't uh, like when he goes yellow when I'm in the air. This boss? Yeah, this <laughs> boss. He goes yellow, and I'm like already jumping, and then he just hits me. Would you well, say you don't like the last there. phase of this boss? <laughs> no, that wasn't that was the boss. second to last phase. Okay. <laughs> we'll just say you don't like the last phases of this boss. Don't like this boss. <laughs> Which bosses have you liked in this playthrough so far? Uh, <laughs> so well, he is playing and he has to reach to talk and we probably yeah, messed him up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the hand cramping uh, makes the game a bit, a bit less enjoyable, probably. <laughs> I, uh, Belfast Belmont says that Ori 2 only has one really good boss. Yeah, that was the that was the problem I had with Ori. So Belfast Belmont says it really makes you feel good when the comp, how good the combat system it really is. Oh, when you have the final boss, it makes you feel how good the combat system really is, which is a problem because the rest of the game is such has such little challenge to it. Now, I played Ori 2 on hard mode. Um, I don't know if you did too, Melfus Belmont, but... I, there, there, was a, there was a beetle boss near the beginning of the game that I thought was pretty good. I don't know if it's the most memorable boss ever, but it was better than the other bosses in the game. In my opinion. I don't know. My opinion on Ori 2's combat is probably one of the more controversial opinions that I have. So I felt like the combat, like the bosses weren't very good, but the rest of the combat was pretty good. Yes and no. I don't like wave-based combat that much. I find it boring, especially when it's the same enemies you've been seeing. This is a risk. And that's kind of where, like, when you're in the levels, enemies are bash fodder. <laughs> that's what they are. You're not really trying to kill them, so really where the combat stands out is with the bosses and with those uh, combat shrines that you have to fight waves of enemies. That's actually something that I thought about the final boss, is like, he just, like, uh, I don't want to be spoilery about this, but it's like, they it uses an attack at one point, I'm like, you know that this attack is going to do you way more harm than it's going to do me. <laughs> I love those bosses that kill themselves. <laughs> um, we're not saying that's what happens. We're not spoiling anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Belfast Belmont says that they, they that they played on hard mode and refused to use healing. That is a good idea. I think trying uh, refusing to use healing in Ori 2 is is fantastic because I feel like it's imbalanced like crazy. Yeah, that is something that 
um, can make a boss like really fall flat. Like in uh, Shantae and the Seven Sirens, the healing in that game is so strong that I just didn't even feel threatened by the final boss. Oh man, in the Shantae Risky's Revenge and Pirate's Curse, I don't think I even... I don't think I used potions until like the final boss of both of those games. But like, you don't even need to use consumables to have a ridiculous amount of healing in that game. Oh really? Yeah, like you have consumables and you have tons of consumables, but then you also have like a spell that you can cast and you can uh, get enough mana regen that you can basically spam it and it refills like half of your health or something like that. Yeah, that was always my, or that was my issue with the first two, or the, the two Shantae games that I played. I actually got the original, um, so I could review it at some point. Nobody's requested it, but I got a hold of the original. I'm so interested close. in seeing how it compares. Holy, that was really close. <laughs> uh, healing can be really interesting. Healing can work a lot like... Um, so Sphere Curbon says the healing in most games usually... Or not healing in most games usually makes it better. Uh, how about that gleam light healing? Oh my gosh. Okay, so that's... <laughs> Obviously, I had trouble with that with that boss. I'm not saying that that boss was necessarily bad, but I was certainly bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I probably would make the argument that that boss wasn't very well done, especially considering what came before it. That's a pacing issue. Um, mm -hmm. In a different context, that boss may have been okay. If it just healed a bit less... I love how it's like your own personal hell if you like trade hits with the boss in that game. <laughs> <laughs> like it never ends. You never lose. You're right. just in purgatory. It's like those Greek gods that fight for eternity. <laughs> so, so, am I wrong boss. to assume that the cart is completely random to the boss phases in this game? I haven't been paying that much attention, but it might be that they come in a specific pattern, like a specific cadence like you can see the cart go by in the background yeah but when it comes it's hard to say because it doesn't have to do with the, what the boss is doing it's hard to say because the phases are um keyed to how much damage you're dealing to the boss so and you're dealing variable amounts of damage to the boss so it's possible they're following a very specific pattern but it crosses over with other patterns yeah the I bet that the um, it's just on a timer. Yeah, I'm willing to bet that. That's also the easiest way to program it. So, so it looks like I can barely sit in the edge and not have the uh, baseball enemy hit me, but that's a lie. It does hit me. I was looking at the chat and bringing up Jonathan and Charlotte again. I like Jonathan and Charlotte. I don't. I don't. I thought that they were fine characters. Portrait of Ruin is a much more enjoyable game if you go into it with the intention of only playing the content that you need to play. When you try and 100% that game, it gets really boring. See, Metro Advantage should be fun to 100. percent Yeah, and some but people shouldn't be feel boring, obligated to 100 percent them. <laughs> they shouldn't be boring for sure. My observation was like when the yellow phase appears. Sometimes it's just when the cart's coming and I need to be jumping. But then sometimes the cart is nowhere to be seen during this phase. Well, I think you can jump and then air dash and then go underneath the horseshoes. It looks like the cart or the um, roller coaster is telegraphed in the background. Oh yeah, it's telegraphed for sure. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to dodge it. I'm not talking about it being telegraphed, I'm talking about it being synchronized with the box. Yeah, I think that has more to do with the fact that the boss is, changes its phase based on how much damage you deal to it. There you go. So 
So I was playing a couple of platformer-based Metroidvania games that included bosses, and essentially you have to platform until the boss kills himself. Those are funny. You don't deserve an A minus. You do pretty good. Who's on the to say one. what you deserve? Well, do you want to keep going, Master? Uh, how far in are we? I actually have no idea. Your first file is 53%. How far have you been before? No, I mean, like, how far into this stream are we? Oh, oh, sorry. It's 835 right now, so we got about an hour left. Because we can switch to the randomizer or whatever. It's up to you. Uh, you can play all night if you want. It's up to you. Well, it I, doesn't sound like he wants How much to. time do you want to play the randomizer? <laughs> how much time do you want to watch me bomb jump? <laughs> I, actually have, <laughs> I actually have save states past the bomb jumps because I knew that we didn't necessarily want to watch me do that the entire stream. Unless you guys really want to watch me do that the entire stream. <laughs> <laughs> of course. For the, it's one of the most entertaining parts of the stream. But I have been playing it uh, offline just a little bit just to figure out where some things are because I'm tired of not making any progress. So I do know where some progress is and I hope that doesn't upset anybody, but... <laughs> that Sarah says that they don't care as long as they're allowed to troll. <laughs> Foreground elements have killed me so many times in this game. <laughs> Oh yeah, those are the things that are supposed to kill you. Oh, you mean in front of the... Like, yes, th layer. things that block your Stuff view. that's blocking my view and then something happens. <laughs> oh no! You could have parried. Yeah, we've been playing uh, A Link to the Past in the Super Metroid randomizer since the beginning, I think. I think that Since was, the beginning. I think it was the first game that we played <clears throat> yeah. on stream. And we're still playing it. Which is why I went yes. and looked for a progression item. <laughs> we were committed. <laughs> which, by the way, I looked everywhere that wasn't in the bomb jump section, and I could not find... I found three items that were or things that weren't just rupees and, and uh, arrows. But I did not find any progression items outside of the bomb jump area, so that is the only place we can go at this point. That is sad. After I found the progression item, though, I did stop playing. So uh, once once I get it and we actually progress, then uh, then it'll be blind again. Speaking of tedium, <laughs> <laughs> so close. Oh yeah, we're we gonna talk oh, about yeah. like what constitutes filler. Yeah, that was one of the subjects we wanted to bring up. Part of that, it, like something that we've mentioned before, is whether or not enemies having too much health is filler. <sighs> and that's definitely an issue, I think, is in this game. Enemies having too much health? Yeah. Cool. Well, like well I said, if you're more accurate with your shots, then, you know, it's you can go faster, or you can evade certain enemies. Like, I didn't have to kill the pretzel guys, I just didn't feel comfortable dodging mustard from off-screen. So it was coming at a random height without killing the pretzels. So Melfus Belmont says it's not filler, it's just bad design. <laughs> yeah. How do we define too much health? Just... Like, you can't just put a number out there and say... That, you know, you don't ever have enemies with more than 5 HP or whatever. No, we can go to the randomizer now if you want. Okay. Um, I will get that open. I'll just leave the stream running until I get it open. And I'll let you know I have it switched over, and I won't accidentally uh, close Discord this time. Okay. Or at least try not to. And murder some balloons. Yeah, so my opinion on what filler is in a game is anything that it feels like it's wasting the player's time. And... Sometimes that is what happens with um, enemies, and sometimes it 
they feel like they have too much health and it's like a challenge problem. So if an enemy, like if you have to kill an enemy to get past them, then it winds up being filler when they have too much health. But then if they just, um, like if you want to kill them to like get drops or something like that, then it's a different issue. There you go. This is the button I want, right? I didn't lose Discord, did I? Am I still here? I can hear you. Okay, good, good. All right, um, you guys can switch to Twitch if you want to watch the the yeah. randomizer. <laughs> so basically, Mortal Manor. Yes, Mortal Manor. They definitely had too much. I think we brought up the question of whether or not that was filler while we were playing Mortal Manor. Yeah. Yeah, I specifically remember. Um, me saying that enemies having too much health is filler and then Malthus uh, disagreeing with me. Making me, uh, making me... <laughs> I think it's Sarah's doing it to troll me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably go talk to my Automod after this stream. <laughs> Wait, what's Automod doing? She's swearing and it's, it's blocking her. Uh, <laughs> This is a family-friendly stream. <laughs> hey, it's it's kind of supposed to be. <laughs> I mean, I didn't swear a single time playing Cuphead. Did I? I don't, I don't uh, know. You, you, did, you did drop one, I think. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, are we at PG-13 now? Okay, do you see this up here? Do you see that? That's cool. If, oh no. Oh. Do you know where that is? I have to have the space jump in order to get the speed boost. <laughs> On this terrible, terrible seed. <laughs> How did we end up with this terrible, terrible seed? <laughs> I didn't put it on hard mode, I put it on normal mode. I have no idea what the constitute is normal in this game. <laughs> Did Mel, Atsuro, and others at least enjoy Cuphead? That's good. Or did yeah, they? we discussed how the point of streaming is to watch the streamer suffer. That, that is the point, right? Yeah, I've played two, like, suffering games in a row. <laughs> I like how you're counting Ori in the blind forest. <laughs> yeah. You're suffering games. I mean, I'm counting La Milana too. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm still playing. <laughs> right, if I can't get at least some lift, I'm just going to load. I'm going to eat more espresso beans. Right, I'm just gonna... <laughs> yeah, you got your hands free now. To... I am I am done with... Uh... Whoops, that is the wrong save state. I can rehabilitate my left pointer finger. There, see, now I'm at the top. <laughs> The magic of uh, save states. <laughs> right, I'm I assume that here. you hacked your way up here. I may or may not have used the game genie. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to assume that. I have did. proven that I've done it twice on stream, so I don't not feel there. bad about it at all. No, I did not. <laughs> I, did do, I did prove it there. I actually did it on my first try when we played last week. So has anybody watched the Barbarian review at all? Not yet. I've been meaning to. I in I included the uh, the death um, my stream advertisement, the the one where I totally botched it and died to the enemy right at the top of the bomb jump. Oh, in the room to, like to the right of here. Yeah. So everybody who is there gets to enjoy the. Uh, why is the game slowing down? Oh. It's at speed 80%, I think. So you might have tapped that. So when I was trying to do this um, off stream, I actually put slow down to see if maybe I could get the bomb jump while the game is slowed down. By the way, that makes it harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's, the, here's what you're supposed to do. 
If you remember correctly, I did this and then I died when I got to the top because I was so badly damaged when we finally got in here. From the lava in the previous room? Yeah. Let's see how far I can get before I... Let's see if I can get some lift. Someday, if I fi have time, I may try uh, mastering this game and actually speedrunning it, but that, that is not the time right now. You've got a lot of other projects to work on, too. That is true. Alright, so I had to save here because these guys like keep shooting their fireballs. Which I found out you can kill these... No, you can't kill these guys. Okay, there's guys later that you can kill. These guys do a lot of damage. It's probably because we don't have the gravity suit yet. Yeah, you're supposed to at this point. Yeah. I don't think you can even get to this area normally. Oof. No, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> just just load it again. I am, I am. I'm, I'm just... I don't have it on a hotkey, so I have to go over and pull down the, the, the thing. Alright, are you guys able to see uh, what people are saying on the stream? Uh, yeah. Because I'm going to be a little focused for a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to let you guys having, handle that. Having hotkeys for saving and loading, not only could you accidentally press them, but also it should be a hassle to load or save a state just because of the power it provides you. Yeah. I, I have too much power for one button on your controller. I have abused save states in some games before, like battle toads. I'm going to admit that I'm probably gonna die a lot here. That's fair. Oh god. I still think it should be mildly inconvenient though. I will not I will not cheat past this part here. Sorry, my kids are talking, I'm gonna go on mute for a minute. But yeah, get it. starting to use safe states is a lot like starting to use a guide where once you do it once, it becomes like you're desensitized to using it. It's like, oh, I'll just do this all the time now. You are so dead. Okay. Those guys, you basically have to use a screw attack to hurt them. I think these guys are right past where you get the screw attack. Ugh. So in Metroid 2, when you use the screw attack, you're basically invincible. Whoops. And I don't remember if that's the rule in this game or not. I yeah. think you can still take projectiles. I think you might be able to hurt them with super missiles, but it takes a lot. All right, this is charge the... shots. Still don't have the charge beam. I don't have the charge beam, no. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> You know, it's funny, I did this on my first try when I was doing it offline. It's just that, that online pressure. <laughs> and trying to talk while you play. Right, and my son keeps uh, <laughs> jumping out and yelling things in the background. So they're, they're potty training right now, and one of them, their favorite thing as a reward for potty training is we have to call up their grandma and grandpa and everybody else on the phone to let them know <laughs> that they went potty. It's, just, it's a weird phase of life. I actually question how the human race has survived for so long. <laughs> like, when we didn't have... When we had to, like, carefully... Uh, get our water from like rainwater and collect it and things like that how did we survive children just throwing their cup on the ground because they were just done like <laughs> well, those children died yeah. <laughs> quote they unquote died <laughs> they just didn't survive <laughs> oh is that it's funny the I don't... question of course is should we call Children who don't behave. Should we what? A call them. <laughs> that is what our stream is about now. The worst thing we could possibly talk about. <laughs> yeah, I think another thing is though, if your kid uh, throws their cup of water on the ground and there's no more water, then they have actual repercussions for it. 
Yeah. Because they wind up thirsty. It is true. They are thirsty later, they'll have to lick the water off the floor, and then they'll cry. Then they'll lose more water. You think they'll learn <laughs> better from that? Okay, we got this. <laughs> okay, I swear that my dump button just didn't work just then. Okay, we're dead. Once the lava hits me, we're pretty much done, because I think we're normally supposed to have the gravity suit, which allows us to jump high enough. Sorry, that's her. I've just had... I don't know. Since I played Cuphead, my attitude has just become extremely hostile. <laughs> Did you play Cuphead knowing that you don't like it? <laughs> I mean... I'm enjoying well, the fact that you're like playing all these games you dislike on the stream. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, I, I play games that I give lower reviews, but not because I dislike them. It's because they're interesting because they're not as good. I like Cuphead, it just also has a lot of garbage that I don't like. Oh, so it's like La Mulana. For me. You do like La Mulana, you're admitting you like La Mulana just now. <laughs> I admit that there's a lot of things in La Mulana that I like, I just don't necessarily like it as a whole. Okay, well, Which I have said before. That is Cuphead ultimately... obviously has great presentation and... I mean... Hello. It's, it's, it's interesting. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and save stay here because we went took way too long to do all that. No, I'm not playing Portrait of Ruin on stream. That's <laughs> also that's um I've been playing through the Castlevania games like on my laptop just because I don't know, I feel like that's a good place to play it. Okay, so there's other treasures back in this area, but like I said I did play ahead a little bit. I'm not going to try and hide that. So I'm going to go straight to the one that's relevant, because the other ones are terrible. Like, most treasures you get in this dang randomizer. <laughs> Oops. I forgot those things existed, to be honest. The uh, boulders. Yeah, me too. When I was playing through this part, I was like, oh. <laughs> I don't remember those. Maybe. Maybe. Is this like a normal place people go? Okay, so when I originally played this for my review this year, um, I actually got lost in this area because I did not know you could pass through this wall and using the um, x-ray goggles does not reveal that. Oh, yeah, I remember that wall. That's one of the walls that's... Now, I don't hard. know if it's the emulator and I don't know if you can see it on the stream, but the flashing makes it very apparent that there's a passageway here. And I'm like, is that normal? Like, would you see that on the Super Nintendo on a CRT? Or is that just the emulator? That's a good question. Because that makes it better, but not great. <laughs> That's like one of the so, problem areas, in my opinion, of this game. What kinds of, like... Is it the sippy cup that we know today? Or is it like a cruder form of sippy cup? Is the purpose of the sippy cup to prevent the liquid from spilling? Oh, you think, you think that they invented the sippy, sippy cup, cup to survive? Like calling it an old sippy cup because it's a fake nipple. I'm not sure. I was just is. talking about uh, finding articles about sippy cups. I'm sad that they don't have the animation for when you get the gravity suit in this randomizer. Well, there's probably places that you can get it that would be very detrimental. That's probably true. It'd be cup indeed. I'm pretty sure they called them bottles. <laughs> Alright, I'm not gonna get too much into it. I'm gonna go ahead and save again. <laughs> See, once you start, you can't stop. No, I know, I know. I think we're all tired of watching me run into dead ends in this game. <laughs> in this case, I think it's understandable. Maybe if you had that reserve tank, it wouldn't be so much of an issue. Oh, I actually I agree. the reserve tank when I was looking for everything. I didn't even get it, actually. I found a lot of heart pieces and stuff like that, and I'll probably go back and get them when I remember, but... I just wanted to progress. That's all I wanted. <laughs> I just wanted to move forward. And I think this leads out of this area. That Metroidvania addiction. Yeah. Interesting. So obviously, 
They can't quite simulate the texture of a nipple from these vases. I assume unless they put some kind of resin on it, I don't know. I just love it where we've headed on our conversation <laughs> the, here. The ancient <laughs> to be <pick> cup review. <laughs> the bottle review. I mean, those are... It's a decent vessel you've got there. I mean, I drink from it. <laughs> I completely lost my train of thought now. <laughs> Someone in the comments give us a topic to talk about. <laughs> Uh, sippy cups. <laughs> we like this topic. <laughs> Talk about it for the next half hour. <laughs> I like how it feeding vessel compilation. I can't click the link right now, but that sounds. I imagine that ways to keep babies from wasting food and water were well known throughout history. I just don't know them now because we're a bunch of wasteful modern first worlders. <laughs> Perhaps the babies know instinctually when there's not enough food. Maybe. It sure doesn't seem that way. So you should be able to go to most of Meridian now, right? That is correct. And that's actually the direction I'm heading. Actually, where I'm heading is hopefully to some place that's going to heal me because I don't like being at this level. And once I find that, I'll head to Meridia. Also, so it's like the second last area in the game, so the enemies do more damage there. Yeah, Norfair was the second to last area of the game. So obviously a baby's cry is to alert the parents, but would you also say that the point is to annoy the parents so much that they will just do whatever it takes to stop it from crying? Are you making another M analogy? No. Because the babies cry bottle ship? I wasn't. Would, would you say that a baby crying is unfair difficulty? I was it coming zombies. Unfair difficulty. It is at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, man, you missed me play Cuphead. Yeah, you missed all of it. It was great. He loved the first phase of every boss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can actually talk about, like, Metroidvanias or something. That was great. <laughs> General bosses are venture baby related. And babies are related to uh, other M. <laughs> which is clearly a Metroidvania. So what about bosses that are babies? Pretty sure there was one in the trailer for Blasphemy. Yeah, there is at least one. Baby. And that boss is terrible. That's a strong word. It's just not a very good boss. <laughs> I mean, it's some Blasphemous. What do you expect? There's some good bosses in Blasphemous, especially now that they've patched them, some of them. Alright, get ourselves a full refill, and then we'll head to the right and go to Meridia. Oh, is Metal, re is Metal Union out of early access now? that game from Humble Bundle, okay. Nobody gave me a key to that game. So, would you say that roguelike or otherwise random games do bosses better or worse than other games? I don't um, think there's really a, like, I don't think it's property of a roguelike to have good or bad bosses. Okay. I think that Dead Cells has good bosses. One could make the yeah. argument that because they're designed for repetition, they are generally better made bosses. One could argue. Hmm. No. I don't play a lot of roguelikes. No, I felt that Dead Cells had some really good bosses.
maybe people like the bosses and roguelikes more than other games just because they're more familiar with them because they naturally fight them many times over the course of the game. Well, I could see you starting to hate a boss more. So I think in the case of a roguelike, it's more important for a boss to be inoffensive than, like, good. Because if, you, yeah, the, if it's a bad boss, you're going to get more annoyed with it than if it, like, than you caring whether or not it's a really good boss. This is true. Bad bosses are made much worse if you have to fight them any time. So perhaps the people who make roguelike games know this, and they will make their bosses less awful. Or safer. Right, or safe. I can explore this place it's when probably, I get speed boots. They're probably less likely to include a weird gimmick boss if they know that people will be facing them many times. Yeah, so mediocre bosses. Like, you're more likely to get a mediocre boss in a roguelike than a outright terrible boss. <clears throat> or a good boss. Are the bosses in Spelunky good? I'm actually asking because I've not played that game much. I don't know. I haven't found any bosses in Spelunky. Are there bosses in Spelunky? Another sort of are. You don't know how I, um, good I've it feels. I haven't gotten very far in Spelunky. To finally have the gravity suit on this darn seed. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta use my x-ray glasses. Hey there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I didn't uh the extra glasses are better when you have the wave beam. Yeah. So I tried to get this particular item without the gravity suit, like when I was searching everywhere to get stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting that was extremely difficult. It is really hard. <laughs> Because as soon as you touch the water, you just can't jump anymore, and you fall straight down. You have to wall jump in order, even, in order to even get into this area. <clears throat> because of the water gate in front. The water gate? <laughs> yeah, water. I thought we said no politics. <laughs> 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 Is there anybody that would argue that that wasn't a scandal? <laughs> Still politics. That's true. No, I don't know why. I've told more jokes today than I have, like, <laughs> in the last several weeks. Yeah, when you get more comfortable doing things, you're more comfortable doing jokes. I don't mean on the stream, I just mean in general. Oh. I've just been slinging slinging absolute knee slappers around all day. <laughs> I'm sad I couldn't get that energy just now. This is probably not the best way to get into Meridia, even though this is the way you normally go into Meridia. I can't remember, you get the space jump in Meridia, so I think most of Meridia is completable without the space jump, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure you get the space jump inside Meridia. Yeah, you You think that I would have this game memorized right now, but I'm like reminded of room. So I, I didn't complete it last time I played it. I'm like, I don't even remember this room being in the game. <laughs> oh, better get that health just to have it. Never know when you'll need it. Yeah, we're getting close to it. And, and Salmis is asking about GameStop, which we brought up before the stream. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's gaming related. It's true. <laughs> I wish it was because they were making a resurgence, although I don't really care about them that much. <laughs> I mean, 
They, uh, they resold stuff. They, I mean, they served their purpose back when games weren't as readily available online. Right before digital distribution, and they're kind of less relevant now. I used them a lot back in the day, back in the PS2 era, so... I was a... I am not going to save in that, just in case we can't get out of here for some reason. Because we don't have the ice beam, we can't get back up that shaft again. Oh no. Can't we just wall jump up? Uh, that's true, I probably could. And since I had the screw attack, I could probably cut my way through all those enemies. Yeah, I'll just use a save state when we feel like we need to. Uh, so do we want to talk about like different kinds of bosses, like puzzle what? type bosses versus... I just got grabbed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so puzzle bosses, I think, if it's like one gimmick, but then you have to repeatedly execute the solution, that's not a fun puzzle boss. But also if the boss has one solution and you execute it and it's over, it's harder to call it a boss. Yeah, lines of epic I, I would still rather always... have a boss where you just execute a puzzle boss where you have to execute the thing once instead of having it be stretched out unnecessarily. I think Zelda usually like they generally are puzzle bosses, but you usually have to do the thing three times. Well, I was thinking more of like like something from um, we mentioned earlier that. Demon Souls boss. Yeah, so you gotta do the thing twice and then you can just go wreck it. Two switches. Right, or um, in Dark Souls 3 there's a similar thing that happens. Pretty much every single boss in Treasure Adventure game was a puzzle boss too. Treasure Adventure game was just 2D Zelda. Yeah. Yeah, if... like the point is, if a game is going to commit to being a puzzle boss, it should, um, once you execute the solution once, that should be it. So then, um, I guess it would, it would not be a pure puzzle boss, where, like, maybe just one of the phases is a puzzle. By the way, can we talk about how genius that shaft is? Can you just see the little glimpse of the fake Metroid? <laughs> oh, we, can we fight Dragon now? I think so. Super Metroid does that stuff all the time, and when people say that this game doesn't have a story, I'm like, wait, 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 wait look, look, look. I think you need to have <laughs> this the, uh... game. Yeah, like you could write down just a long list of every, like sequentially or semi-sequentially things you see and like what those encourage you to do. Right. And it's 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 nice. I enjoy reading through those and going, wow, yeah. The game did encourage me to do that. It's underappreciated you know, sometimes, I think. It is. That's it's good at being relatively subtle. But still, uh, One of the other things job. that plays on is the nostalgia for the original, which unfortunately doesn't work if you play only the Zero Mission. Well, it appears that I can't get in this way. Does Castlevania do any good uh, Castlevania games? Um, one do of the ones good that, games like that. One of the things that they... they <laughs> In this game, they kind of use it to subvert their, your expectations. This is a good place to save, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, in this game, they kind of do it to subvert your expectations. In Castlevania... I wonder if I can break this and then jump through it. Sorry. I'm ruining my Castlevania thought. They pay homage to old Castlevania games, but I don't think that they really do it to enhance the story. What happens if I go down? Nothing. There's a crab elevator? Oh my god. Need to play Order of Ecclesia. <laughs> I 
So Salamis makes the point that you should be able to beat a boss in two to three minutes. I think that's probably a good rule of thumb. Although there have been one or two ten minute bosses that I actually enjoyed. If you're gonna have a really long boss, um, it's best to split it up with like a, two different encounters. Yeah, I think it ought to... Yeah, like a final boss would be one where you could get away with having a lot more time. Like, you really want to avoid having a final boss feel anticlimactic. Also, you know, the problem with having a boss that's really long is that if it's punishing, then it will be much harder to actually beat the boss. Well, we've been here Like, for... you know, if you have a punishing boss, but you can get through it fairly quickly. But then... It's, it's much, much harder to do the same boss, except, you know, if it took longer, because you have to play perfectly for that much longer. So I think I'm not supposed to have the screw attack, and I think that might be what's helping me. No, well, maybe not. I remember these things from my playthrough. Those waterfalls. Yeah, normally you wouldn't have the screw attack at this point. I think this crab shows you that you can go through the ceiling at some point here. Can you have a waterfall while underwater? Yeah, I'll come back there. And if the water's falling, like it would be kind of a jet stream at that point. Could a temperature gradient do that? Oh. Or would you need something that's significantly denser? Uh, so temperature does affect density. So I guess that would be possible. Well, water is weird with the way it affects density. We'll see what we'll fill this area with pink. Why not? Okay, this is a one way passage. Yeah, having any one encounter just be really long, I think, is generally a bad idea. Just because of how much you have to repeat if you die at the end. Or if there's checkpoints within the encounter. I mean that, of course, that's like separate encounter. You can still have endurance bosses where they're balanced around you, you know, if the, if the attacks are easily telegraphed and such. Perhaps like the Nameless King from Dark Souls 3. He has a lot of health and he telegraphs everything, but he's punishing. And but um, he's punishing because it's an endurance boss. He just has so much health. Because if he didn't have as much health, uh, the attrition he bosses. Oops. Yeah, haven't actually fought this boss, but I believe that's how it be. It seems like one-way gates in this place. If I remember correctly, this area has a lot of really weird hidden missiles that could be important things on this randomizer. And I really and wish we had one, the extra there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of them that require the speed booster. Like I think this is the area with the like most challenging speed booster things. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. This has some really obscure shine spark. Okay, so there's a couple of power-ups that are marked on the map there. One of them I think you have to have... So there was a gray door, and I think you have to have uh, Dragon defeated in order to get that. Let's go ahead and explore to the right over here. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Can I please get my screw attack when I jump? There. I think these guys will just die one hit to... 
and two hits, okay. Their weakness is the plasma beam, because this is the area you get the plasma beam, so it's they're basically there to show you how powerful you got after you get the plasma beam. Yeah. So Sasame is saying the Nameless King is very different depending on what your build is. Do people who play hard video games, do they also like spicy food? <laughs> this is an interesting study. You should uh, <laughs> you should find a list of hard games that they should probably like, ask them if they like it, and then ask them if they like specific spicy foods. But do you but like hard so games, etc.? Yeah, do you like hard games? I don't remember the... Will you play a game that's masochistic? Yeah, I guess I like games... Like, I don't want the game to be hard, but I don't want it to be easy either. And not, I also, too, not, like, not too spicy, not too not spicy. You want it to be yeah, spicy. I also kind of prefer my, like, it to just be like a little bit spicy, but I don't want it to be painfully spicy. Uh oh, we figured out an exact correlation here, guys. <laughs> For one specific person. Maybe it's causation. If you like spicy foods as a kid, you'll like Dark Souls. So if we wanted to like increase the value of for, uh, from software stock, we'd like give uh, spice like train kids to like spicy food. Dope. That is the trick. I'm hoping that the room that has the space jump in it normally doesn't require you to have the space jump to get out of it. And I'm pretty sure this is the room that has the space jump in it. Like up in this area here. Well, maybe not this area. I actually don't know where this leads. Yeah, so an unspecified one of my family members bought a large amount of crazy hot pop chips. I don't really know what a pop chip is. But apparently they all hated it. So they were like, here, have this box of 32 bags of pop chips. That are really spicy? I mean, they're not really spicy. You're spicy, though. Okay. Do I want to be here? I don't want to be here. Yeah, I do not want to be here. I'm eating them right now. I can get into that a different way. I know it's back there because it's one of the places I explored when I was trying to figure out where progression was. That is where the magic cape is, which you only need for one treasure, and that treasure was also not progression, so... <laughs> <laughs> that goes back to Zelda Link to the Past having too many one-time use items. I mean, you can use it all the time, it's just... you generally don't need it. No. That is where I want to be, I think. Alright, let's play Environmental Station Alpha now. <laughs> Except the grapple probably isn't as good in this game. No, it's not as easy to use. Although it does fire at a similar angle, so... But sometimes it doesn't feel like the controls are working. <clears throat> I say that it's either my emulator or it's me, because the way some of those speedrunners move around this game, there's no way that they have control issues. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can salvage this. Can I salvage this? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Do you guys like any strange food? So when I was dating my wife, I ate cheese on my rice, and she's like, that's disgusting, and now it's like one of her favorite things to do. <laughs> like, why would you have cheese on your rice? Mm -hmm. 
Strange for what country? <laughs> that's a good question, actually. It, is there anything that's a really strange food for the U.S.? That we eat? That means strange else? food for wherever you live. Unfortunately, the U.S. has kind of like invaded every other country, so I think that most of our food has been exported. Do people all around the world love peanut butter as much as I do? Uh, I don't think anyone else likes peanut butter as much as you do. Sandwich it's kind of a thing. Melanesa. Melanesa. I'm not pronouncing that correctly. What is what is that sandwich that I'm not going to pronounce again incorrectly? Peanut butter and jelly? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you were saying. It's what Salmi's put in the chat. Uh, that doesn't look familiar to me. Milano. It seems like it's a South American version of schnitzel. Hmm. Empanated meat. I don't even know what that means. Is that it sounds like good. Pie? Bread with bread? Oh, okay. Empanated sounds like empanada. And I know what that is. Oh, we overlooked a Dead Cells question. Oh, have you tried one? the DLC? Uh, I have not. Salmis, have you played it yet? I know you bought it. I think you did. Uh, Dead Cells, Dead Cells. DLC that just came out. Hey, look, it's a reserve tank. And missiles. <laughs> I am so glad we came back here. Okay, I'm just gonna bomb in here in case I'm missing like another secret. I think that's all. Yeah, I here. I may try the new DLCs if I decide to play more Dead Souls. I kind of like the game. The game I play from time to time. It seems like there's a lot of fun to be had and a lot of things to unlock. I just want something kind of generic to play. Not generic as in it's a generic game, but like. Something I can play while listening to something. The hardest thing for me on that game is I never really hit a point of satisfaction with it, which is not true of other roguelikes that I've played, so I don't know. Like, its ending feels incomplete, and I almost wonder if it's meant to feel that way. That's how they can sell you more DLC. Yeah, that might be it. And you know what, that's fine as long as they get to an ending, I guess. I mean, some games aren't about the ending. I know, I get it. You, you don't want them to firefly it? This is totally a me preference thing, is I like my games that have definitive exit points. I understand that, of course. But not having a definitive exit point doesn't really bother me. But the point of Dead Cells is that you're not supposed to exit, you're supposed to keep playing it forever. I get that. Right, would Warframe be better if it had, uh, like, an end of the story where you're like, congratulations, you saved the galaxy? Would that be better, Coldreth? Is Minecraft uh, better because it has an end? People don't play Minecraft for the ending, though. Some people do. Neither do most people play Roblox for the ending. Dream Maybe games. Hated. I mean, when I played Minecraft, there wasn't an ending. So. Back in my day, we didn't even have yeah. endings to our <laughs> Yeah, I remember those days. Alright, this is it. This is the space jump room, I think. This may lead to Dragon. I'm running out of power lines because I keep using them to find passageways. Let's go ahead and save here in case I die. We'll do it the legit way. <laughs> Hammer fist. Well, I would like to point out that we made it all the way in here and we still haven't made any progress. <laughs> Although I have no I mean, idea. We got the gravity suit. We found more stuff. That's progress. You've explored new tiles. That is your, progress, my friend. You got your first energy or reserve tank. 
<laughs> it's incredibly important. I think we might... Ooh, yes, I definitely need the speed boots to get through that. Now, the question is, is can I see what the item is so I know not to come back for it? Can you not just keep jumping on the sand? Maybe? Let's give it a shot. I can always just reboot the game since I just barely saved, so... I'm pretty sure this is gonna suck me down though if I try. Uh, nope, yep, it just sucks you down. There's a centipede thing. No. That's I think it just grabbed me. Well, we're gonna see what's down here before we, uh. Okay, so there's. <laughs> Wonderful rubies. What's that? What's that? I saw something. Missiles? Okay. I, I'm not very good at doing the uh, aerial. Come on. One game people say is really good, but I never got into is uh, Nuclear Throne. Also, kind of hurt my eyes to play. I never really played enough to like get used to it. No, no, no. I actually really don't think I need these missiles, but I keep saying that, and eventually that's going to bite me, I think. <laughs> Got it. You're not going to try to 100% it? Uh, explain your no. opinion, Salme. What makes Nuclear Throne trash? Nuclear Throne did, Mo. It's locked at 30 FPS or something similar. And, uh... Fast things happen on the screen. Where is this space out? I don't like this room. Alright, well, missiles are good. That'll be helpful later, I think. So, where did I just fall down? So, yeah. I kind of want to get to Dragon's room, but we're not getting there tonight. We only have three minutes left. But at least we're making progress, right? Okay, so what do you think about the Binding of Isaac? He loves Binding of Isaac. <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to playing the game again when the new update comes out soon. It's actually kind of interesting how many people like both Metroidvanias and Roblox. And they seem pretty different. They're both games that, um... Well, Rogue Lights have progression. Rogue Likes don't yeah. really think they can. Sort of. or we're, we're not here to debate what a Rogue Like is. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I should have said Rogue Like. <laughs> it's funny, I still haven't found a true roguelike that I can get into. Like, I've tried many. And I haven't found one that has really satisfied me. I heard that they had definitive ends, though, usually. I guess it's the 13th level or something like that is the rogue standard. Well, they don't have progression, so they have to have an actual ending. Hmm. We need to have, like, an ecumenical council, but for the Metroidvania definition. Well, I'm glad to see that the uh, the speed boost thing is just 100 rubies, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> At least it wasn't something important. And then there's an E-Tank. That's good. How do I get into this again? I forget. I think I have to go around the right side or something. I do want that Probably e everyone has and will tell you to play Hades if you're looking to get into a roguelike. Yeah, I've heard that Hades is great. That. It has good so, gameplay, but um, everyone is super impressed by its presentation. So yeah. what what happens if we do the Metroidvania Council and come up with a Metroidvania definition and then you don't like it? Oh, uh, just like real ecumenical councils, it won't accomplish anything. Okay. People will just continually debate and call further councils, but it sounds like fun. Well, they did finally come up with a definition for um, roguelike. I mean, that is true. That bizarre 
that like list. It, I find it interesting. They, that they, they didn't even, actually. They didn't even really come up with a definitive definition. They're just like these are some things that are important. These are some things that are not as important. I think they said that yeah, that's... it has to have that in order to be a rogue. Like, I find it interesting that the rogue community has done that, but not the Metroidvania community. He uses a good visual novel. Does it have romance and stuff? I'm not saying that every visual novel has to. In fact, I really am interested in the genre, not as interested in the romance aspect, personally. Let's you um, it lets you sort of rank up relationships with people, but I don't think you ever date them. Hmm. So it's like oh, it does have romances? Them. No. Oh, I did it. Nice. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's an aspect that I've never really had too much interest in myself. On the other hand, my wife uh, wants to design a Notome game, so... <laughs> Does the game punish you if you romance everyone that you possibly can? I was watching somebody play Persona 4, I think it was, and they literally just like romanced every single girl in the game. Yeah, I think you kind of have to in order to get all of the social links or whatever. I think that's like a thing. I think I have to oh, okay, that's good. This, if I remember. Don't want to have any qualms about banging every character in the game. <laughs> They're great gods, so it's expected. <laughs> I guess that's true. Wasn't it mostly just Zeus? Eh, I think the other ones had affairs and stuff. Alright, well on that, I think that's a good time to end the stream. <laughs> <laughs> From bosses to romance. <laughs> the Our Metro right. Video Podcast. It's almost ex uh, Zeus fanfics. <laughs> Alright. Well, thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye.